I'm Tanya Fox, and you're listening to Fox Talks Business Podcast. I started my career in the corporate world, but always played to my own tune and love to think outside of the box. This didn't always serve me well with the bosses, so I made the decision to become an entrepreneur. And that little seed of entrepreneurial curiosity continued to grow as I branched out into retail, service, and franchise businesses. Now, I have been fortunate to have amazing successes in the last two decades, but they did not come without some really big failures and even bigger lessons learned. And that's why I started this podcast, not just to share the failures, but to show you how you can turn every failure into a success. We're going to hear from some amazing humans from around the world that are going to share their stories of the good, the bad, and the motivational entrepreneurial life has to offer. After all, life is too short to make all of the mistakes yourself. So why not learn from each other? And of course, we're going to have some fun because as I always say, well, you know what? I'll tell you that at the end of the episode. Hello, Foxy listeners. Today, we're going to talk about peaches, profits, curbs, and collaborations. How are we going to connect these things together? You're not going to have to wait long. Shannon, thank you so much for being my guest on the show today. Oh, gosh, yes. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So talk to us a little bit about how you got in, you know, because people are probably going, what? Peaches? We're going to be talking about peaches? So tell us a little bit about your story, because I love sort of the the origin story of yours. Yeah, absolutely. So it was back in 2012, 2013. Um, my family comes from a, what we call a coin op specialty, and that's coin operated businesses. And think like car washes, like old school car washes, vending machines, laundromats, you know, those sorts of arcades, like those sorts of businesses. And so my whole life, I've always had a fondness for those kind of underdog, um, you know, off the radar, old school businesses. And it was in 2013, I was going through a life transition, my dad, who um, was my mentor and I learned everything from developed brain cancer. And he eventually passed away um, in two years um, after his initial diagnosis. But during that time, you know, I just really, I had been, I'm an award-winning journalist. Um, I trained as a librarian. My family is all entrepreneurs, all of them, uh, my brothers, my dad, myself. And so, you know, we, I'm, I grew up with the hustle and grind and it, it, at that point when my dad got so sick, I decided, you know what? I just, life is too precious. Time is too short. Let me see what else I want to do. And at that time, my son was 11, Finn, who is now 21 and my business partner. And at that time, you, you know, everything I was doing because of the hustle and grind was taking me away. And so I was, you know, doing 80 hours a week, sometimes, sometimes more. And I really wanted to be with Finn, um, especially during, you know, school breaks. And a friend of mine for years had been telling me about his peach business, which he ran with his kids. And he is a reseller. Um, he doesn't do it anymore. He's um, aged out of it because it is very labor intensive. But he he did it for a very long time with his two children. And he kept telling me, Shannon, this is the best cash-based business you have never heard of. I promise you it's an ATM machine. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Farm stands, peach stands. Okay. Mm. But then, you know, at that point in my life, I was ready for a pivot. I wanted to be hands-on. I wanted to go back to the basics. I wanted to have a tangible product and I wanted to be outdoors. And I wanted my son with me all the time so we could enjoy each other's company. So I decided to move to South Carolina for a summer. And we learned from my mentor, his name is Rob, the original peach guy. And we worked alongside him for an entire summer. We learned everything from, you know, visiting the orchards, which in the U.S., most of them are still family owned. Thank goodness. These folks are two and three generations into ownership at these at these independent orchards all over the U.S. So I got to spend a lot of time in the orchards and developing relationships with the orchard owners. And then, you know, I learned um, how I also had a background in logistics, thank goodness, because at the time we opened 100 stands, I really needed those skills and they came in, they came in um, handy. Um, but I learned how to resell peaches and I learned 
um, uh, how to locate peach stands and what the season was and, you know, how to um, negotiate and how to forecast just in time inventory. I mean, everything that would go along with it. I learned that first summer. And I also learned everything not to do. Everything that I could do wrong, I did do wrong. And what a great learning experience because every failure just um, helped me get closer to the solution. And so I was able to build a business blueprint from that initial summer. And that business blueprint has pretty much remained the same. It does evolve um, and we add on to it. We hang different revenue streams off of it, um, even, you know, this season, this upcoming season, but it's essentially the same. And what I learned, what I learned about the peach business is that it is a business that makes people, whether it's the, the grower, the orchard owner, the, you know, the, the farmer, it makes them happy. Um, it makes me, the reseller, happy, and it makes the consumer happy because it's a transition in peaches, or I'm sorry, a transaction in peaches, which start to finish is just happiness. So yes, I say we, we sell peaches and that is the tangible product, but we sell an experience that's steeped in happiness. And that's why it's so daggum easy. Well, and I think we're starting to see more people these days. I mean, we're seeing it all online of people, you know, coming up with these ideas, well, what they think are innovative ideas of, you know, oh, like go to these easy businesses, like you were saying, the car washes and the, you know, selling firewood in a kiosk and, you know, all of these other things. We're starting to see a drive towards that again. Um, so it, it's, it's sort of interesting to see, you know, sort of that evolution back to the be, you know, back yes. to the beginning, but so what, you know, when you were kind of sitting there and when you were sort of going, you know, I, I really want some time, you know, to sort of slow down, what were some of the things that, you know, that surprised you when you kind of got your, got yourself ankle deep, I'll say in peaches, <laughs> Well, it wasn't a way to slow down, that's for sure. And in <laughs> fact, the way I went about it, it was like speed up 10 times, you know, normal, which was okay. My son was with me and we were on this great learning adventure, um, you know, not only in our relationship in my entire family, but, um, you know, from a business aspect. And, and Finn was getting to learn entrepreneurial skills from the age of 11. And so now he's had a decade in all of these skills and these experiences are like second nature now. So it comes very easy to him to, to conduct business, to actually sell things, to get up in front of people and speak and negotiate and, you know, train employees, et cetera. So that, that was a real blessing. Um, and I think the most surprising thing that I learned um, was number one, how, how profitable is. That's probably the biggest thing. The second thing was how easy it is. Um, I, mean, I teach 15 year old kids how to do this business and you can start for $200. That's what I'm saying. The barrier to entry is so low. It is so low risk, but the rewards are really, really high and the net profits are really, really good. So it's, it's like virtually no risk. It is a lot of labor. I'm not going to lie. It does require, I mean, a lot of physical labor because you are outside and you are moving, you know, bushels of peaches and, you know, other produce. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a labor of love. It's like you're working with your hands. It's almost, I wish I farmed. I wish I had the talent and the skills you know, to be a farmer, to be a grower or, or an orchard owner, but I just don't have those skills. So I do the next best thing and I resell what they lovingly grow. So what I learned is um, it's just, it's a business. It's like I said, inherently easy. Um, it's inherently happy and consumers have, there is this cultural memory. There is this um, nostalgia and sentimentality to a farm stand, to a roadside stand, to a fruit stand. And so what I didn't realize is that consumers are already primed 
to be happy, to enjoy the transaction and the experience, and to buy a lot of stuff. And they don't haggle. They don't negotiate. They pay what you ask them to pay. So it's like, whoa, this is so easy. You don't get that. I mean, that it's, you know, you don't get that in, in other avenues quite often, right? Right. right. And, and I mean, and I don't mean this in a predatory way. I mean it in a sincere way. We can charge whatever we want to charge for the products that we sell, for produce, um, because we are working with local, you know, farms and orchards and growers and we are bringing their produce to the consumer. So we're in the neighborhoods where the consumers live. We're practically on their doorstep. So we're doing a service and we're promoting, you know, where the, the produce came from. And we'll talk about the, you know, the Eford peach order, uh, peach orchard or um, peaks where we get peaches in Texas. We know their story. We've met them. You know, and we we talk about the type of peaches. We talk about the history of the orchard. We talk about the family. We talk about the varietal. So it's a very knowledgeable experience in 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 creating value like that through storytelling around the products allows us to charge what they're truly worth. So we we you know some people in their minds, consumers. Or sometimes people who want to start their own roadside stand, they think wrongly so, but understandably so, that they should charge what the grocery store is charging, or they should charge what Walmart is charging. And that's that's absolutely wrong thinking. And in fact, we break that pattern in the consumer's mind because you know, we don't charge by the pound, for example. We we price in a completely different way, which then disassociates, right? Breaks that pattern between yeah. grocery stores, Walmart, and us. And by creating that value in the storytelling, we can charge enough that the customer, um, there's no... Uh, there's no pushback against the pricing. They leave happy. They enjoy what we get. And we make a great living that allows families to, you know, pay for college tuition or a new car or down payment on a new home or a Disney vacation for like a family of six, you know, big ticket items these days. Well, and I think it's so true because I think there's so many people that are ingrained. I remember, you know, visiting my mom when she was sailing in Puerto Rico on this little island, Calabra. And I remember walking and of course they have like, you know, the little like grocery stores that is like, would be the equivalent of like a corner store kind of thing. And I remember walking past this lady's house and she had this lemon tree and it just smelled heavenly. And I found out she was the owner of the store. And I remember saying to her like, how much for your lemons and she was like oh I have some in my store from from California and I'm like no <laughs> uh, that just looks like the juiciest lemon I've ever seen in my life but it it was funny because as Maura had the conversation with her she said you know a lot of people don't want this they because they think it's just like backyard kind of stuff and I have never in my life before tasted fruit that was that flavorful. Like it was that I remember coming home and being like, you have never tasted a mango until you ripped it off a tree and ate it. Like I've never seen, you know, it, it's just a whole different sort of experience than a, than a trucked fruit is now what I call it. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. And it's, you know, and it's, I think it's really, you know, regardless of what business you're in, I think it's, you know, the, like you were saying, the storytelling is such an integral part because there's value in that story. There's value in knowing where that, you know, that item uh, came from, what the history of it oh, is. Yeah. It's, it's almost like you're buying a piece of that farm when you take mm -hmm. it home with you and you're, you know, you're making whatever it is that you're making out of those. Yeah, it's it's essentially provenance, just like in the art world, when you can attribute a story and a history to an item, it automatically creates value in the consumer's mind. And so therefore you can increase the price. So you had started this peach stand and then and then you grew it. What made you want to kind of expand? Because of course, originally you were going to get more time. So did that, you, you just couldn't get out of that or <laughs> just to ingrain the growth? I, I think... So what I want, my initial thoughts, and this is, these are still my thoughts today, 10 years into the business, 
And in last year and this year, I am finally clawing back that time um, and working on the business and not in the business. But initially, I was so curious, you know, coming from coming from a background, you know, working with multi-million dollar companies and, and my family had owned and I'd been part of a multi-million dollar company with software development, working with convenience stores. I was curious if I could create, you know, a business blueprint that was easily repeatable and scalable. You know, could I make, you know, a six figure business easily seven figures? You know, could we scale from five stands to 10 to 50 to 100? And, you know, would it be worth um, the, the amount of effort and labor involved, you know, to make between two and $10 million worth of sales um, over the course of a peach season. So what I found out is, yes, it's this business model is so stinking scalable. You can do one stand or you can do a hundred stands. It is the same business model for every single stand. You just have to hang a lot of logistics off of it, you know, and be able to, you know, acquire your inventory, truck it in, you know, um, you know, do fulfillment and delivery, do waste cleanup, manage hundreds of peoples. All of that can be done and it's scalable. So depending on who wants to get into the business, it it really is, it really was, and it still is about, you know, making your own decisions. As an entrepreneur, we have our own desires, we have our own priorities. And for most entrepreneurs, the reason we get into, you know, entrepreneurship is so that we can call the shots. We can set our own schedule. We can set our own hours. We can work with the people we want to work with. We can sell the stuff that we want to sell and, and that we're passionate about. And all of that's true with the peach business. And what, what I discovered is depending on the entrepreneur's desire, the entrepreneur's yeah, desires, they can work one stand or they can work a hundred. They can work seven days a week or they can just work, a, you know, a weekend, like 10 hours over the weekend. And the business blueprint allows for that. You just have to know what outcomes you want, you know, and put it in the blueprint and the blueprint will tell you exactly you need one stand or do you need 10? Um, you need to be open, you know, 50 hours a week and have 25 people and you need to sell this many peaches or otherwise you can just have it as a side hustle. So it became this wonderful scalable model. And I have, I personally, and, and Finn, we have taken it up and down the scale and without, without missing a beat, we do it, you know, almost every single year. And then we try different revenue streams or different um, aspects of the business, you know, like, um, we started working with farmers markets. So we actually set up now inside farmers markets. We partner with homeowners associations and we do a mobile farmers market. So we'll go into a neighborhood, you know, like at the pool or the rec center, set up for a couple hours and allow homeowners residents to come and shop. And then they can place their order online and come pick it up or spontaneously shop. So there are all these pivots that are going on um, every single year and we'll scale up or down, up or down, just depending on how many kids we have that are working with us or who want to work um, and how hot it is. Cause it's like 115 degrees here during the <laughs> summer. And so that, that if it's like last year, it was so hot. We did as many stands as we could. And I mean, it was just so exhausting. We had to scale back because it gets a little dangerous when it's that hot, yeah. you know, being out on concrete and asphalt. So we didn't do, we didn't do as many stands last year and I'm hoping it, um, it will not be as hot this year and we'll be able to Finn, Finn's running the show now. He's running all the logistics. So it's going to be up to him this year. Well, and I think this is, you know, a great idea for people to kind of stop and think about because it does give you that opportunity, like you said, to sort of grow as big or as small as you want, but also the opportunity to change it. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you were saying, if one season you go really big and then, you know, life happens or whatever, you just want to break. Uh, exactly. There isn't that much in another sort of traditional brick and mortar business where it's a little bit harder to do that, right? You can exactly kind of play around with it a, a little bit more. 
And the other thing that, you know, I, I also like about it is the fact that it gives you the opportunity. I'm a big person for collaboration. It's kind of what this show is based at. But I think this really gives you an opportunity for those, you know, neighborhoods or small towns to work with other organizations, like you were saying, a local pool, a library, like all of those other places that kind of need help, you can sort of create that around this because a lot of people will go to a farmer's market and then discover something else that's nearby. Or, you know, we see that a lot in, you know, I'm in a smaller community and whenever we have a farmer's market, you go and then you're like, oh, I didn't realize that store was there. or I forgot about that. Or, you know, so it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's, it's a business for you, but can also be sort of a community builder. Yeah, absolutely. We have done over the years, we have worked with cities. So like here in Texas, there's so many little small towns. Um, we've worked with cities to set up like fall festivals. So like, you know, we kicked off the first annual fall festival for Glen Rose, this little town, about 40 minutes from me. And um, we for the entire month, we had fall festival events every single weekend. We had face painting. I mean, we had a giant pumpkin patch and we sold produce every single weekend. We had a farmer's market. So that was to benefit the city and the residents of the city. We've worked with nonprofits, actually, believe it or not, uh, selling peaches is a great fundraiser. So we will work with churches because they'll have pumpkin patches too in the fall. And we teach the volunteers how to run, you know, their own peach stand or their pumpkin patch so that, the, you know, the, the nonprofit has free labor and then all the funds just go to the nonprofit. We've worked with veterans groups and civics groups to help them do fundraising and to set up their own like peach stands. Um, we work with a lot of other vendors too. We will bring in products to complement what we do. Cause now these days we sell a whole lot of stuff, not just peaches. We started initially and that's all we sold is peaches and we've branched out today, but we work with a lot of local vendors like, um, chicken farmers, you know, we'll do farm fresh eggs. We work with lots of beekeepers. So we sell honey. We work with um, people who do um, jams and jellies and canned goods. We sell a ton of bulk produce and we sell it to these types of producers. And then it comes back to us, you know, as a canned good. So now we and we will white label it for us sometimes, but then also we just support the other vendor. So then we bring their products in and, and we allocate space for them so that we can promote them as a local, you know, grower or farmer or locally sustainable business. So, I mean, that's just a handful of the kind of collaborations we do, but it just makes it so much more fun. Well, it allows you to sort of reinvent your business each season, you know, kind of thing. And and for those people, like there are a lot of people out there, myself included, that sometimes are like, hey, I, I want something different. You know, I want to add something new or try something out. And like you said, with something like this, that, you know, that you can start for, you know, a, a, a very small cost, uh, probably one of the smallest costs for going into business. Um, but also something that you, like you were saying, I think, you know, I wish I would have had this when my son was younger, right? Because of course he, same thing. He came to work with me. I'm fortunate that he went the right way. I always said either he's going to have the most amazing work ethic or he's going to be like, I'm done. I've been working since I was six months old. I'm lying on a couch. <laughs> like, But a lot of the skills that I see him using in his job today was learned from those moments of him doing things with me, of him you know, needing to push a stool up to our brick and mortar store to like punch people's orders in, right? And the things that people would, I'm sure would be like, you're not allowed to do that with kids, but he loved it and he enjoyed it. And those are such tangible lessons, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for kids to learn. And this is something that they themselves can do, you know, to get money for, because I mean, let's be honest, there's not that many. I mean, I never grew up with my mom being like, here's a car, right? You had to figure out the money yourself. This is a, a nice way to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. And the kids can, you know, legitimately, if they run a single peach stand, they own a single peach stand over the summer. So we're just talking summer break. It's like, you know, end of May to the very first of September when they go back to school. 
they can earn an academic year worth of tuition. They can earn, you know, a year's worth of living expenses. They can, you know, buy a car, whatever big ticket item they need to, you know, front for, well, they can earn it over three months. Yeah. And that that's the beauty, you know, work hard for three months and then, you know, come school, focus on studies and you've banked all the money and then you're just able to live off that for the, you know, the nine months of the academic year. So as you were going in this, you started to create a video course. What made you decide that, you know, that you wanted to sort of create that and tell yeah. us a little bit more about it? Yeah. So initially in the beginning, you know, way back in 2013, um, it never occurred to me that this was a coaching type opportunity or, you know, um, an evergreen course. What did I, what we inevitably did, um, and we still do today is we would just teach people like directly face-to-face one-off-one, all of our family and friends, and then friends of friends and, you know, acquaintances would say, oh my gosh, what a great thing. Can you show me how to do it? And so we would boots on the ground. Yeah, come on you know, hang out with us for a week and we'll, we'll teach you how to do this. So we did that all the way up until COVID. And then when COVID kind of, you know, put us all in our houses, uh, me and another partner sat down and wrote out, codified everything that we had been doing um, face to face. And so over like, I think it was three months or something, put everything together, you know, did a total brain dump, like everything I had, all of my checklists and spreadsheets um, that, that I normally just did on paper, you know, we, we put in a spreadsheet and we formalized. So that's how it came together as actually a video course with all of these documents and trainings was, you know, just being on lockdown and COVID and actually doing a brain dump because it occurred to me And the reason I had that realization is because, you know, we were all going through such a crunch. It's like everybody was panicking about, oh my gosh, how do I need cash? I need cash now. How do I pay my rent? You know, how do I make income when I'm locked in? And I thought, well, this is a great way to make cash and it's super easy and it's super quick. And it's one of those essential, you know, work, work roles that Mm. um, would be allowed, you know, to do business. So that's what we did. And it's just, so that was 2020. It's taken off since then. Oh, that's exciting. So where can people go now to find out more about the the course, learn more about whether this can work for them? And then can you talk also a little bit about like what area this works best for? Yes. So you can, um, any listeners can find us at roadsiderepublic.com. We have a ton of information there and we have um, links to the course. We have a lot of freebies like e-guides there as well that you can download, like as a vendor, you know, what's the best way to hyper locally promote your business. And, you know, if you want to get set started selling at a farmer's market, there's an e-guide for that. So we have a bunch of free stuff there. We have a TikTok channel, Roadside Republic, and there we have a lot of behind the scenes video content a lot of a day in the life and, um, you know, oh, how I flubbed or, you know, (laughs) messed up on something. I I share the successes and the failures. Um, So we have a lot of good video content on our TikTok channel and um, uh, all the social media channels. But running a roadside stand, I mean, truly, honestly, you can do it from anywhere in the U.S., how it may look, where it's located, and the licenses and permits you may need are going to change according to, and it's usually, it's not a state thing, except for California. California is completely different. Um, But in the rest of the U.S., it's usually a township or a city entity. So what you want to do, if this is something you're considering, you want to go to your city zoning office, and you want to ask them about a seasonal permit, you want to ask them about a peddler's license or an itinerant license. License. It's called different things in different parts of the country. But basically, if you just tell them, I need a seasonal permit to sell whole, uncut, unprocessed produce, um, most of the time you don't need a permit or a license, especially in the South. You just need approval and a contract with the property owner so that you can set up. 
um, you know, to sell from a parking lot or, you know, an intersection or something like that. But, um, and it can take different formats. You know, we do so many different varieties and flavors of the roadside stand now. Like for example, we will we will be on um, at a busy intersection and we have like a 10 by 20 tent and it's semi-permanent. It goes up end of May, does not come down till the first of September. And we work out of that tent. And most of the time it's in a big parking lot. So it used to be Kmart's, you know, we would co-locate yeah. with mm -hmm. Kmart's. We would do really, really busy convenience stores and gas stations. Um, but we would pick parking lots that are big enough to accommodate the tent and then the traffic so that cars can easily park and there's ingress, egress. Um, we will do, um, like I said, farmer's markets now. We also do festivals and fairs. We do shopping markets and gift markets so that wonderfully tens and dozens and hundreds of opportunities for us to set up um in different parts of, you know, a town or a city, or even like where I am in DFW. I mean, the, there's so many opportunities. So you just kind of have to look and see what fits, you know, your desire, your timetable, and um, your schedule the best. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, it just gives a different idea for you know, that person who is, you know, wanting to jump into entrepreneurship, but maybe not full time, for the student, for the mom, for that, you know, it's just, it's, it's such a diverse um, collection of people that you can have that can do something like this, which you don't see in a lot of businesses. So that's why, you know, yeah. I think this was like exciting to sort of have this on and, and that I hope that what it does is cause people the next time they drive by a roadside stand is to kind of stop and take a second look and yeah. think of it a little bit differently. Yeah, it, it's a great it's a great business opportunity for moms because you can bring your kids with you. That's what I did. He was eleven, and and we encourage that. So any any uh, moms who work with us, and we have a lot of uh, teachers on summer break who are in the stands. Bring your kids. You know, it's a family environment, and you know the people who work in the stands love it, and then the consumers love it. It's supporting, you know, family values. It's supporting local. It's supporting community and children and students. Um, and it's it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. So just before we go, if there's one piece of advice that you wish you would have known, you know, before that first time you went to go and, and, and share that week um, in starting this business, what would that be for our listeners? I wish I would not have waited so long to, to, to try it because the barrier to entry is so low and because the capital cost can be so low. There's no reason why you shouldn't try it, you know, this weekend. Um, all you need is like $200 worth of peaches, a table, an umbrella, and a handwritten sign. And that's it to get started. And then you just roll your profits back into it. But it's it's that type of opportunity where you cannot fail because everybody loves peaches just like everybody loves babies and dogs and ice cream and clouds you cannot fail with this and I wish you know there's kind of an American mindset that oh if it sounds too good to be true it is yeah well nothing this, nothing's easy <laughs> Yeah, right. And and that and I I've just I've given the disclaimer this is not a, you know, labor easy business. <laughs> you will work hard, but making money is not the hard part. Yeah, I love that. Well, we'll make sure that we have all of the links to where everybody can find you, learn more information as well as the course and also follow you. I'm excited to follow you on TikTok and see some of those, you know, be behind the scenes and I think it's important to share both sides of it, you know, the good and, and the learning. I don't like to say bad, the good and the learning. Yes. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Of that. Um, thank you so much for spending time with me today, Shan, for sharing all of your knowledge and for helping, I think, our listeners to think of produce and profits together from now on. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you so much to Shannon for coming on the show and sharing this. I know there might be some of you out there who are going, okay, but I live in Canada with you. <laughs> what am I going to do? What I want you to do when you listen to episodes that you're like, well, I don't think this really applies to me. I'm not in that season. First of all, 
I think every single place, no matter where you are, especially in the U.S. and Canada, I can say for certain, has fruit stands. See them all of the time. Um, so that is not an excuse. But what I want you to think about is when you're looking at other businesses, as opposed to hearing the stories and thinking, oh, this doesn't really apply to me. One of the things in doing collaborations so much in my life is I've learned that then is an opportune time to take a look and go, how can I look at the way they're structuring the business? Some of the models that they're using, some of the advertising or marketing that they're using, some of the storytelling, them talking about their why. Is there some portion of what it is that they're doing that I can make applicable in my business? So if you're like, yeah, no interest in doing that, there's always going to be something there for you. So in this example, think of, is there ways that you can then scale your business? Do you have that video template, that handbook, that how-to guide for your business so that, God forbid, something should happen to you, somebody else would be able to step in, open the book, and more or less be able to run your business? This is the thing that entrepreneurs don't think about a lot. And I'm really hoping this episode made you kind of think of that or think of, you know what? Maybe that's what I want to do. Maybe I'm just at a point where I want to, you know, only work for summers. Or do you have an entrepreneurial spirit of a child that maybe instead of delivering newspapers, something like this might be an option? And Shannon and her son have created a very easy how-to video guide with all of the templates and access to absolutely everything you need so that you can help that happen, whether it's for you or somebody in your immediate family. So the next time you're out, like I said, I want you to stop when you see anything on the side of the road, any stand that's on the side of the road. And I want you to think a little bit at the profit behind the peaches. And no matter what it is that you're doing today, stop and take time to smell the peaches and have fun. Because as I always say, if you're not having fun, why are you doing it?